Hi, this is Roger. Thanks for dropping by. Sunday chat today, I'm going to circle around a subject that has no answer. Well, I still keep getting asked, <laughs> frequently. Um, but before we get going, because uh, that's going to go around in circles until uh, I get fed up. Or <laughs> if you get fed up, you can just walk away. Um, the um, last unboxing video, obviously within those um, three new orchids, was a zygopetalum. And I said that the only reason I'm going to attempt another one was because of the comprehensive notes from Michael McCarthy. And quite a few people, which were posted on the Facebook group. Quite a few people have said, we don't do Facebook, how can we have the notes? So I asked Michael if it was okay first, you can't just take something like that. Um, so the notes that were produced by Michael on the Facebook group have now been copied into the description of the unboxing video. So they're there with the plant, you know, uh, that, it, that they, well, in my case, that they, that they relate to. Um, and several people have actually asked about those notes since I updated the description. I don't know why I bother writing those descriptions, I really don't. <laughs> the notes are there for those that want them. A um, couple of people asked, I mentioned that I'd put the um, Cattleya Harrisoniana into the virtual competition for this month by contriving a picture. Several people said, could they have a look at that picture? Um, so I'll pop that up. So you should be looking at that now for a bit. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to mention, it's um, we're down to about 14 and a half hours now, I believe. By the end of this month, which is not long, we'll be down to about 13 and a half hours. So as we head into September, our tropical orchids get into their comfort zone as far as light is concerned. Now remember, our light intensity where I am in the UK is less than it will ever be in the tropics. So although we're coming down to the right day length, the intensity will be lower than what a lot of them will be used to. So, um, but yeah, day lengths are dropping like a stone. Um, <laughs> I got woken up early this morning. I did sat in the flipping dark for hours and hours and I thought, is my clock wrong? You know, because it just seemed like, you know, I mean, I'm used to getting up early, that's not a problem, but so obviously back in the height of the summer, you get woken up at four o'clock, it's daylight, you know, it certainly isn't now. Um, yeah, so the old uh, mornings seem to be drifting away now, which under normal circumstances means I get more sleep now because I don't get woken up by the daylight so often. Um, so uh, there'll come a point where my body clock says you've had enough sleep whether it's dark or not <laughs> that don't work <laughs> you know we won't still be in bed at eight o'clock in the middle of winter that don't happen so yeah just be aware that the problem with the day length changing is people forget that means the sun's not in the sky for as long which means it doesn't climb as high its arc is lower so its high point is lower in the sky, which means it gets in your windows more than it did a month ago when it was up here, yeah? And the arc was higher. So at midday, you know, shining in a window at midday, you, you only lit up the windowsill, whereas now you're lighting up half the room. So, uh, yeah. And rain, we're having some. It's been doing that all morning. It's only gentle, but it's wet. And heat's gone. And without the heat, this lasts longer. You know, even when it stops raining, things will stay wet longer. I've noticed this morning, um, the grass is already starting to come back. There's already green showing. So it doesn't take long, does it? Um, but yeah, we've, we're having rain. Um, it looks like we're going to have rain on and off <laughs> for the rest of the week. It was a lovely, I've just literally um, watched the weather forecast, whatever it was, five or ten minutes ago. And um, there's a swirl around a low pressure with all these potential heavy storms like that. And you know, there's usually a quiet bit in the middle. Guess where that's sitting? Yeah, right there. <laughs> so I still haven't had, apart from that one I filmed, which was very short-lived, I haven't had a storm, I haven't had the thunder and the lightning. 
<laughs> Some people have though. That's that. Also worth mentioning, the time flies by. To me, it seems not that long ago we were doing the Project Orchids. They're due to start up again in September. Yeah, so I'll have to, you know, dig all my stuff back out from the um, external hard drive, bring it back onto the laptop, try not to crash it because it's big. <laughs> what I've done on the laptop now, which I didn't do last time, it's got its um, normal drive, the C drive, which is where all the software lives. That's where the, the, the operating system, that's where all the Windows stuff is. It's on that C drive. And if you don't do anything about it, so is everything else. And I think that might be what crashed my laptop. <clears throat> because I had the automatic updates on, um, I think that the software tried to install the Windows upgrade that is sitting there at the moment not being allowed in. Um, they've changed, it, it's basically a reissue rather than just a little um, maintenance run that you get every, well, every month or so. Um, and that's just sat there. And the fact that it's a replacement, it's big. It's obviously huge. And I got a feeling last time when that crashed was it was trying to put that in and I had so much of my own stuff on that because that's the um, the SD, SD drive. It's like, a, it's like a memory card that you'd put in a camera or something like that. It works like that. It's got no moving parts. Um, I got a feeling that filled up. That filled up halfway through a Windows upgrade. It's just going to crash and no matter what you do you, you can't get at anything anymore because it won't load. So that's a possibility. So I've put that on hold. That is not being allowed in at the moment. <laughs> if, you, if you look up, are there any problems with Windows 10, I think it's 2004, <laughs> be prepared to start scrolling up the screen. Because there are a few. So that's not going in, probably for another six months or more. <laughs> Maybe never. <laughs> uh. Right, so that's that. So the Project Orchids will be coming round again, starting in September. Same again as last time, four parts. Same plants, if I've still got them. I'll sneak that in. It's a forerunner, they're not all here anymore. <laughs> Don't worry, there's not loads gone missing. But no, I think there's been a loss, maybe two. Um, but otherwise, it will be the same plants in the same sequence. Have a look at them, how they were last time round. Have a look at them now, um, chat about them. They seem quite popular. So, uh, I think they would not be too popular if they came round too often, though. So this year, we're going to have four. So they're every three months, effectively. If I find that they're not getting watched, you know, the interest isn't really there, then I'll do the same thing again next year, but we'll go down to every four months, so there'll only be three. So there'll be a bigger gap in between. Trouble is, you, you miss so many that are in bloom. <clears throat> the bigger the gap, the more chance they have to bloom in between, you know, this, this part and this part. But anyway, that's coming round again. Right, was that all? Yes, that's, that's, that's so I've got my notebook here. I scribbled some notes down. Right, the subject then. I'm going to talk around and around and around the subject of trying to work out on Cydium into generics, like what might be in them. Well, the first thing I'll say is, have you got a proper name? Because if you've got a proper hybrid name, you can go to places like um, uh, Orchid Roots, Orchid Roots dot something or other, CA I think it is. Uh, you can find it. Um, just. Google Orchid Roots, it'll come up there somewhere. And um, if you've got a name, you can put the name in and it'll show you the um, progression from the original two species to how it actually got to where it is now. And that's when you see a complex Oncidium intergeneric often, um, or, or even pure Oncidium that's nonetheless a complex hybrid, when you look at how many plants have gone into it, then what you have to think is each one of those had to produce seed. So there had to be a successful pollination 
the seed had to be produced, it had to be flasked, blah 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 blah, little tiny plants coming out of the flask, grown on to get to blooming size to see if it's any good. <laughs> and so all around the world there's loads of those getting thrown in the bin because they didn't work. The people who are really good at hybridizations don't get it wrong as often because they've been practicing. But if you think like you you know you've got well, like my Harrisoniana, for instance, um, you've just seen the picture of that. It's basically a sort of magenta colour, petals and sepals, there's no markings. And then it's got a creamy coloured lip with a bit of yellow, and it's got a basic catlier shape with a closed over um, lip, closed over the top, that's typical of bifoliates. Um, I've only recently found that out. <laughs> I've never noticed before. Um, but it has a basic shape and it has a basic colour. Now, if you had another Cattleya, say one that was pale in colour, and you wanted to get a bit more purple into it, you could think, right, Harrisonia has got a pretty good magenta uniform colour. If I bring that into the hybridization, you know, that, that could deepen the colour for me. Yeah, that may not work at all. <laughs> may not work might not even happen. Some people introduce a particular orchid to, to bring fragrance back because they lost it somewhere down the line. Yeah, that doesn't always work. And if you think about it, sometimes fragrance will just pop out of nowhere, like a fluke almost, like Shari Baby for instance. Oh, I wonder if it'll be fragrant. It ought to be. It's got a bit of that in it and a bit of that in it. Yeah, it didn't have any chocolate in it before, did it? So it's a bit hit and miss, but those that are good at it and do it for a living, basically, um, tend to get somewhere near what they were after um, by, by doing it. But yeah, so some, if you've got a name, somewhere like Orchid Roots, if you haven't got a name, you're going to struggle. It's as simple as that. Now, you, you know, you can go on um, Google Images and just put in Oncidium type yellow and see what comes up. See if you can find your plant. Um, you might be lucky and get a hit, but in the Oncidium Alliance, there are an awful lot. <laughs> yeah. But there are some things you can think about. Um, and part of it may be, like, maybe you've got the first bit. Maybe you've got the first part of the name, the intergeneric bit. So you might have, like, um, Brassada. You think, well, what the hell's that then? Well, you can look that up, and it'll tell you that it's a Brassia crossed with an Ada, which most people haven't heard of, but it looks like a brass here anyway, but those hybridise quite frequently. You might have a Brassidium, or a Brassier and Oncidium, yeah? But is that a real Oncidium? Or was it a renamed Odontoglossum? So even when you've got that first bit, it ain't gonna, you know. And a lot of the, um, like you've got um, Bratonia, that's Brassier and Miltonia. We know that now because the Onia bit's on the end. When they were called Miltasia, well, what's the Milt? Is it Miltonia or Miltoniopsis? We didn't know, did we? Unless we looked it up and somebody told us. But you didn't get it from the name. But now they've switched them around and uh, put the Brassia first and the Tonia on the end. We know it's Miltonia. And that makes a lot of difference. If it was Miltoniopsis, that's going to put a lot of influence into its care, especially if it's up near half. You know, like two, two types of brassias crossed with a Miltoniopsis, it's half Miltoniopsis. So it's going to be a cool grower. It's not going to like bright light. And yet the brassia bit wants bright light and doesn't really care much about the temperature. <laughs> so you, you're going to go round and round and you're going to struggle and I've got to the point now where a lot of the time I, I, I can't be bothered and I've lost the ability to care. Like the previous unboxing, we had these, um, can I get them out? I suppose I can. Make the point, even though one of them's going over now. You know, you get, you get something like this. What is that? Let's, I, I can't remember whether it came with a name or not, and for the purposes of this chat, it doesn't matter. Let's say it's just a no ID, had Cambria written on the label, or worse still, orchid, <laughs> or houseplant. They do get some strange labels. But you could look at that. Now, I look at that and I think that's probably got some brassia in it. 
because the petals and sepals are quite extended but there's an awful lot of oncidiums look just like that certainly in shape and quite a few of the uh, sorry I, I meant to say odontoglossums if I didn't um, odontoglossums have a similar shape to that a lot of them some of them have wider petals and sepals and look a little more full but there's more like this than not and some of them have quite thin petals. If you take my Naevium, I can put a picture of that up because I've got it. Um, that's got twisty, spidery type petals. Well, if you put that Odontoglossum in a cross and it passed on those traits, you're going to get probably the spots and much thinner petals and sepals. And you might get the twists that weren't there before. Yeah? But... I would say that has probably got Odontoglossum in it, I'd almost say definitely. Um, it might have a bit of Brassia lurking in there, might not. It depends on the type of Odontoglossum. It might even have some Miltonia in there. What I doubt it's got is Oncidium. Why? Just have a look through the Oncidium blooms. What have they nearly all got in common? They're little. They haven't got the size. Now think brassia. How big are the brassias? I've got one in here that measures nearly 12 inches from tip to toe. So if you put that in a hybrid, it's going to make it big <laughs> or bigger. They're also, brassias in the main, are very big plants. Yeah? So sometimes a brassia will be crossed with a much smaller plant to try and, do, <clears throat> try and reduce the plant size and make them more compact. This is not helping you find the name. But I would say that's got some Odontoglossum in it. I could be 100% wrong. And the way to find out is treat it a bit like an odonto Odontoglossum. So no bright light and try and keep it out of the heat. And make sure it's got some airflow. Um, let's see what happens. Now, it's in bloom when I got it. The telltale thing will be what happens next. Now, if I get a nice strong new growth next, and the leaves stay quite a darkish colour, then maybe it hasn't got the odontoglossum in it and it's not getting enough light. But if they are a good colour, where it is, then it is probably getting enough light, and it may well have odontoglossum in it, in which case it needs to stay cool as well. So you can do some guessing. Yeah? Let's have a look at this one then. See now this one doesn't look anything, there's not anything that's saying brassia in there is there? It's, it's got no spidery look about it at all. Um, it has some blotchy markings that are sort of typical of odontoglossums again. Some Miltonias look like that as well. And that shape is nearer a Miltonia than an Oncidium. It's not very Odontoglossum-like, but it could be. But it doesn't look like there's Brassia in there. Until we step back. That is a massive plant. So I wonder what is in it then. There, most Odontoglossums aren't huge like that. Um, Oncidiums aren't very often, although there are a few who've got large pseudobulbs. So you'd be guessing with that one. Guessing. It implies, by the size of the flipping thing, that there may be some brassia in there, and it's just not come out in the shape of the blooms. It came out in the plant instead. But you're always guessing, so you can't tell. Now some of the names at least, you know, if, if it's got a first name, never mind whether it's got a hybrid name or not. There are lots of them. They vary, and a lot of them can't, strictly speaking, be said to be true anymore. Um, uh, well, like I said, we've got Brassidium. Uh, so that's Brassia and Oncidium. Some of the Oncidiums have been moved out into something else. They're not all Oncidiums anymore. And some have been odontoglossums in the main got moved into oncidiums. I think a couple might have got left behind. Well, certainly on the naming things, like my Naevium is going to be odontoglossum here in this room. 
if it goes to a show, it might have to be on Sidian, depending on what type of show. <laughs> um, but a lot of people are allowing those odontoglossum species to still be called odontoglossum for historical purposes. Um, and personally, I agree. Yeah. Um, so we've got Brassidium, we've got um, Bratonia, we've already done that. Um, while we're on it, the intergenerics don't very often have Miltoniopsis in them. I don't know whether they just don't lend themselves to mixing it, <laughs> like the Miltonias do. Um, Miltonias have got quite a lot of naturally occurring hybrids. Um, so, so they're obviously mixers, even amongst themselves. Um, but Miltoniopsis don't creep in there very often, which in, in some cases, given what these intergenerics are, basically household plants. That's, 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 that's the market they're aimed at. So they don't want to be difficult to grow, do they? Unless some clever person wants them all dead so that you have to go back and buy another one. <laughs> There's a thought. Would they do things like that? You know, would they tell you to put ice all over your plant so that it dies and you have to go back and get another one? I can't believe anyone would do anything so stupid. <laughs> What's more stupid is the people that think it's okay, um, when it probably isn't. You might get away with it for a while, depending on how hot your atmosphere is and how fast that ice melts and how much you put on, but it's not a brilliant idea, to say the least. So, um, the Miltonias get in lots of places. You've got um, Miltonidiums, which is Miltonia and Oncidiums. Um, but those names are often a combination of two. Um, and they're only going to work if they're a combination of two. Yeah? As soon as you get a third option in there, you have to make up a name. Because you can't normally get a word out of the three bits of three separate types of orchids. Um, so under normal circumstances, they'll make up a name. Um, well, Cambria is a made up name for a start. I don't even think that was ever ever used in anger, I'm not sure. Um, but there are loads. Um, if you look up Oncidium intergeneric names, um, there's quite a few documents that have got like a huge list of all the names that have like ever been used and what um, genera make up those names, yeah? Um, and some of them are four. There are a few that go to five. They're very complex. Um, but you might be lucky and get a hit if you just put the image, you know, it, um, look through images. You might be lucky. Um, you might be lucky if the um, tag that you get seems to have some sort of company name on it. Sometimes you can Google that and find the actual hybridizer that's selling these in bulk trade. You know, minimum order, 200 quid or something like that. Um, and they may still have that plant, but they chop and change them frequently. And um, even if they've still got the plant and you find a name and go, whoa, it's probably not a proper name. It's probably their name for their hybrid. Because if they register it, then everybody knows what's in it. And everybody can have a go at producing that cross if they want. Especially if it sells like hotcakes. How long is that going to take then? You're not going to do it overnight, are you? <laughs> You're going to reproduce the cross again from scratch. Well, don't forget with hybrids, you don't have to start from scratch. You can start halfway up. Yeah? If you had two species that produced a cross that was then crossed with another hybrid, say, to produce another one, and then over here you've got, say, a, a species that was added in, and then a cross, you can start halfway up if you've already got that hybrid and a good version of it, you start there, part way up the chain and then start introducing the bits that were at that point. You don't have to go right back to scratch. But most people are not going to do it and the sort of people I'm dealing with watching this channel, I doubt come anywhere near that sort of thing. Um, so. Uh, all I can say with the Oncidium intergenerics is if you get a name, it might not be trustworthy. Um, if you can find it on something like the um, 
AOS register or the RHS register and it's there and it says who registered it and what went into it and the date and all that, then that's the name. That's it, you've got it. Um, but if you've got a name and it's not on the registers, it may still work in ORCID Roots and it may still show you the makeup. The goal of trying to find out what's gone into your hybrid or into generic, if that's the way it's gone, is to get an idea of care. You've got a pretty good percentage of brassier in there, you know you're going to have temperature tolerance and it's going to be up the higher light end of that set. Yeah? Um, Miltonias are fine with heat under normal circumstances, but you've got to watch the light. You can over light them and they'll just pale. Um, and then they're stressed, and they might not bloom as well, if at all. Strange sometimes, you know, get people say, Oh, it's not blooming, it's not blooming for me. I'll give it more light. You no, know, no, let's have a look at the colour of your leaves, because I've not been told off often enough. But let's have a colour, look at the colour of your leaves, because if they are really pale and wishy-washy, you might be stressing that plant with so much light that it won't produce the blooms. So you've done too much light rather than too little. So there's a balance in there somewhere. And switching out of oncidiums now, if you think about, somebody asked about cattleyas with um, yellowing pseudo bulbs and leaves. Therein lies an important bit. And, yeah? Now if your cattleya's got good colour on all the pseudo bulbs and the leaves are starting to go yellow, you might have a cultural issue. <laughs> or you might have stonked them up with flipping systemics. Um, but you could just be giving it too much light and the leaves are starting to catch. Yeah? But if the pseudo bulbs and the leaves are a palish colour heading towards yellow, that could be how it's supposed to be. I'll show you one. Just to sort of prove the point. Oh. Where's my new one? No, that's not quite there. We'll have the one at the back. Oh. Now this is a highlight, not that one, this one. This is a highlight orchid. This needs the light. And, oh, come out, take. And don't knock me Reginelli eye all over the place. These are the natural colour of the bulbs. They are quite a good yellowish green, more so than the leaves, but even the leaves have that pale look to them. But it's a uniform look, yeah? That's my, um, what you call it, my other perperata, yeah? So, the bulbs, the newest bulbs, are more green, yeah? So that tends to match that leaf. But then if you move over to an older bulb, it's got a yellowish tinge to it and slightly paler leaves. Well, that's what perperatas often look like. Have a look round. Yeah? Especially ones that bloom absolutely regularly, like clockwork, with not one <laughs> on the end of the spike, a decent blooming, you know, three plus blooms. I don't know what the maximum would be, but three or four is pretty good, I believe, for perperatas. Um, but yeah, so that's, that is pretty good for colour for that one. On a different type of cattleya, that could be deemed totally wrong. But the chances are it will be the leaves that change, not the bulbs. Yeah? So when they're both that sort of colour, that's normally um, along the lines of how they're meant to be. Are you going to go back in there with knocking, knocking stuff over? <laughs> See, I don't normally pick up the plants at the back while the other plants are on the shelf, because I start at the front, take them off, water them, and put them out there, over the, out of the way, so that when I come to pick up the back ones, there's nothing in the way. And we don't start clouting things and knocking the leaves off, <sighs> like we did with the tigrina. Now, I'll show you. This, this one's new, so this is not me. Um, but this again is a perperata. Um, that's normal. Yeah? This one is yellowish. 
not as yellow as I would imagine it ought to be. The one that's in bloom is green and it's lost its leaf so it's difficult to tell what's up, what that one's up to. This one is pale-ish but not pale, has the leaf to go with it. Um, and this one, strange, this is strange because um, a perperata normally grows one new growth and it, it, it finishes that growth towards the very end of the year and then it normally sits there and does next to nothing through the winter and blooms in the spring. It takes a while to push the spike and the buds up. So this one's in bloom at the wrong time of year for a start. And in addition to that, it's got a new growth going pretty good already. That new growth is going to mature before the end of the year, so I don't know what that one's going to do. That may fail to bloom, because it's matured at the wrong time. We'll have to wait and see. But, uh, it also had a blind sheath back here. That bulb there produced a sheath and didn't bloom. But then I've done that with mine before, haven't I? Two years on the trot we got the sheaths. So every time I pick up one of my new plants now, I look underneath the pot. Because that Master Valier had two slugs under there. And it took me a while to find the flipping things. Ah. Right, um, so that covers the Catlia things. Um, I think you can get quite a bit from looking at pictures on the internet. Because th there are pictures that show whole plants. Um, a lot just show, you know, the bloom spike or a close-up of the bloom, fair enough. But there are some that show, um, you know, the, 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 the plants. You, so you can get a feel for the sort of colour the leaves ought to be. Some are paler by, by, by definition. Um, I mean, I find the Miltonias have a paler colour than some of the Oncidiums for a start. Um, the Twinkles seem to have a palish colour compared with some of the others. Now don't forget last year all of my Oncidium types got paled and washed out because they all got too much light and some of them may still be recovering from that and haven't got their full green colour yet. But um, looking at other people's, looking at plants in shows if you can or looking at YouTube videos of people that have been to shows if you can't go yourself and look at the plants as they go round and see if there's any that you've got. And you can always pause a video, don't forget, and have a good look. Um, <laughs> you've got the necessary thing, like on a phone, for instance. You know, if you've paused a video going around a show on a plant because you want a good look at it, you can just do that on your phone and suddenly you've blown the whole thing up. I can't do that on my laptop. There's no touch screen involved. I need to fiddle with it to be able to do that. So, uh, so phones do have their uses. Um, Right, so Oncidium intergenerics, they're going to be with us forever. Um, they provide an awful lot of colour and in a lot of cases size and in some cases fragrance that wasn't there before in the individual's um, uh, genera. Yeah? By combining them you pick up, hopefully, the best traits from each bit and the combination is better than any of the elements that went in, which is what's happening with the intergenerics. Um, you can cross two Cattleya species together and get something that's worse than both of the originals and is of no use. You might be lucky and get something at least as good as one of them. Yeah, You might not. Um, but in the Oncidium Alliance, um, it's been going on for some considerable time. There's a lot of knowledge out there now of how and what to go about that, to come up with good stuff. Because, I mean, whoever's come up with this yellow one um, that I showed earlier, I mean, that's just a winner, isn't it? It's a lovely golden daffodil yellow with splashes of red. It's just, it's just bright, cheerful, sunny summer colours. Um, you might be one of those that likes the subtle colours, the gentle pinks and the softer things. Well, you know. <laughs> is one. I mean, I'll get this one down and then that will be it, I suspect. Um, this is the Reginellii, which has now got uh, at least two blooms open on each spike. But boy, do they, does this have a big gap between opening the blooms. It's huge! 
Normally you get a spike and the first bloom opens, the, the, the next day the next one's open, or certainly the day after that. But anyway, we've got two out here. Um, now, this is a large strappy plant, yeah, with very, very long spikes. This is not ideal for the household market. The plant's big, the spikes are very long, Notice these spikes are not staked. Are they all bent over? No, they're bolt upright. They don't need staking. Yes, some do. And a lot of that with the intergenerics is they've been bred such that the trait of the plant is relatively compact, but the weight of the flowers is not right for the plant, so they, they bend over naturally. Some of them will even snap with the weight of the blooms. I've seen catvias snap, but normally, again, that would be a cultural issue. There's not enough strength in there that would normally be there. That's a lovely subtle colour, isn't it? There's nothing shouty loud about that. It's a lovely soft magenta purple colour with tinges of pink and cream. Um, you know, so... That, to me, is stunning, but it doesn't shout loud from across the room, and yet when I, when I bought this, it did. Walking round Burnham's, and I, you know, there were a few in bloom in amongst the dozens that they had, and I spotted one of those blooms from quite a distance, and it caught my eye and attracted me enough to make me walk over there to see what it was, and then make my mind up almost instantaneously, we're having one of them. Right. And then once you do, we're having one of them, you then spend the next 15, 20 minutes trying to find a good one. <laughs> they had a lot. If it's the only one there, um, for instance, when I was walking around the private area, um, there was one stunning odontoglossum type. The blooms were like this. It was phenomenal. Um, there was only one. <laughs> and not for sale, not in the sales bit. So, uh, a stock plant. And that's the sort of plant I would imagine that Sarah might get sneak in a show if it was in bloom at the right time. Um, not that there are any shows at the moment. Or it might be kept for introducing into other hybrids. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know for a fact, yes or no. Sarah may actually save seed and get it sent off. Yeah. To actually get more plants. I don't know, possibly. Right, so that's it for today. Um, yeah, as I said, I'd go round that subject of intergenerics, trying to find names, um, what they all mean, and you can go round and round and disappear up your own whatnot, because you don't get a definitive answer, because there isn't really one. And even when you think you're okay, um, like when it's just two, like, like I said, like, like a, a, a brassidium, you know, it's brassier and oncidium, we're okay with that. Yeah, well, most of the brassiers are quite high light, most of them are quite big, so you're pretty safe in making some assumptions. And now what about the oncidiums? They're not all bright light. <laughs> They're not all warm growers. Some are cool. So what, what have you just put in with the brassier now? Um, you need to know that bit. And that's the bit where you get messed up. Because if most of the odontoglossums got renamed as oncidiums, the brassidium, what's the idiom? We know it's oncidium, but is it a real oncidium? Or is it a renamed odontoglossum, which now puts cool and shady in with the brassier? Which means you've got to balance. You've got to think, well, if this is quite a high light one that's temperature tolerant, but probably don't want to get too cold. If this one likes it cool and shady. What have I got in the middle? I've got one that perhaps doesn't want quite the bright light that the brassiers want. So we'll pull the light down a bit. And perhaps we'll try and keep it a little bit cooler and see how it does. And if it is growing well and it's blooming, you've probably got it. If it isn't, then it might be brassier dominant and you haven't got enough light. It could be odontoglossum dominant 
and it's getting stressed because it's got too much light or it's too warm. Do you win? No. <laughs> so you go round the circle again. Um, and so it goes on. So no definitive answer, just a chat around the subject. Um, and that's as good as it gets really from me anyway. And like I've said, I'm not that fussed anymore. I used to struggle trying to find names and, you know, get pictures and blow them up and get every little detail. Is that lip just right? Oh, no, it's not. That column on that is too big and chunky. This needs... Yeah, you know, I used to go on and on trying to find an ID for some of these intergenerics and hybrids. If it comes with a name, check it out. If it's registered, yes, that's your name. If it ain't, might not even be a proper name. So what have you got, really? If it's not a proper name and it's a trade name or some nursery's made-up name, does it mean anything? It'd just as well be called Fred or Bill. <laughs> so personally, I don't worry too much. But I do like, if it is a species, I do like to know. But then you're not going to come across those without a tag normally. You know, in amongst those household plants, you might in a private sale, perhaps, where somebody's just lost their tags and they're selling their collection. You could have some lovely species in amongst there, in private sale, with no names. Most species can be identified from the bloom um, and a bit of the plant, possibly, if there's uh, any doubt. So there we go. That's that. And uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks for dropping by.